31 degrees centigrade, so he's a very tough guy, <laughs> okay? But he's of uh, Argentinian origin, uh, and then he went to MIT, then to Colorado School of Mines, mm -hmm. and ended up creating a very large and uh, very nice laboratory on welding at the University of Alberta. But today his lecture is going to, about, going to be about scaling laws. I don't know much about it, and the brief to him is that he has to teach us. <laughs> not a uh, research type lecture, but he's going to teach us about the method. Okay? And that's why we are going to video it as well, and put it on our YouTube channel. Right? So we've got it on the screen now. Okay. Thinking, thinking. You get to see my feelings for the, the max here. Okay. All right, guys. <coughs> and this is the pointer. Very high tech stuff. Okay. <laughs> so everybody behave here, huh? So, so right. Uh, thank you, Harry, for, for uh, all, all this time here. It's been fantastic. So th this is what I would like to do here. Uh, I come from a background of mechanical engineering, and uh, now I'm a professor in materials and metallurgy. As a mechanical engineer, I dealt with problems that, uh, uh, that had a level of complexity, but people had captured them with lots of generality, and it was easy to communicate, and was easy to, uh, uh, to and enabled you to design things, even if you had never made them before. And by the time you, you did, after you did your design, you could do experiments just to test it. You didn't need to do trial and error constantly. When I moved to materials and metallurgy, problems were a lot more complex, and people could not generalize them the same way. And uh, what I saw is by coming from one field to the other is that in some select cases, there is an opportunity for bringing these tools for generalization and understanding and, and communication to the field of materials and metallurgy. It's not for all the fields. What is most relevant is that I think the type of work you guys do here might fall in that area in which you could benefit from this. So we'll see. What I'm gonna do is uh, take a case study and go over that super quickly um, and hopefully open up for uh, for questions uh, as we go punting in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my case study, and I, uh, it's about friction screw welding. So in friction screw welding, you, it's a solid state joining process uh, that, that is based on very severe plastic deformation that generates localized heat. The localized heat uh, softens the material, and that's the, the way you constrain this, this hot and soft area. Um, so here you have this video, here you have a little schematic of a rotating tool that you get to see here, that uh, as it rotates, it deforms the material. And if you were to look at it from here from the top, you'd see this is the pin, the, this part here, or this part here that was moving, uh, that is uh, solid and is, uh, is, uh, is steel, typically oft often the substrate is aluminum, this is what this process is good for. As it rotates, it generates this hot area around that is soft and very severely plastically deformed and recrystallized and lots of interesting things. And as it translates, all this deformed area that would used to be two different plates become one. All right? So you typically do it in aluminum because you can use a, a steel tool. The, this pin here can be made out of steel. Uh, it worked incredibly well. It's used uh, for making uh, for aerospace applications, many, many good things. Now, people said, sure, it works for aluminum. How about other things? So I know the guy who claims to have done the first experiments in titanium. And this person is a good metallurgist. And coming from that background, said, OK, let's do the trial and error. And uh, the first run was, OK, let's use everything I use for aluminum, but just put a titanium plate. And of course, it didn't work out. And uh, uh, actually, it melted the, the titanium. And these guys started to think, well, titanium has 
lower thermal conductivity, it makes sense that the heat doesn't dissipate as, e as easily and it gets hotter. And by the way, titanium is, tends to be stronger than aluminum, so I'm generating more force, which with the same rotational speed would make more, more uh, g heat generation and I can take it out less easily. And uh, of course, it, I should have melted it. And he tried using this sort of a reasoning process because he's knowledgeable and smart, and finally welded titanium. What I want to introduce here as in my case study is, what if we are not knowledge, as knowledgeable, as smart, or we don't have the machine? But we would know these type of things. Can we use this sort of knowledge a priori to, so by the time we go to do an experiment, the experiment is right? I'm using friction stir welding as a case study because I know a little bit about it, but this would apply to many areas. This is the way you design airplanes, for example. First, you, you, you have some calculations. By the time you fly your first plane, you are pretty sure that it's not going to crash. <laughs> you don't fly enough planes and crash them until it works. So uh, I'm going to follow an approach that, that uh, my student, Karim uh, Tello, um, and, and with my colleague, uh, Tom Leinert, uh, we, we published in ACTA. So, uh, so what is the challenge, right? Number one, I'm trying to avoid the trial and error. Trial and error works. I think we can do better. As I said, you don't crash planes until one works. Uh, but we, we do break enough steel parts and we make enough bad welds until one works. I think we can do better than that. Um, I would like to, to, to figure ways in which we have a right. You will always need to do experiments. I'm just trying to be smart about what I, my first experiment would be. And I want, I want to emphasize this. What, what I'm proposing is that whatever we do should be simple, general, and accurate. Hey, this is like saying I want the best quality at the lowest price, all right? But I will try to make my point in the next few slides that in some cases, which are of use to you and me, that can be done, and we're not always doing it. So <clears throat> this is the approach. Uh, and I'm going to follow up with one slide on each of these as it applies to the friction stir welding case. So in, in this approach, which I have not invented, I, I just try to list more or less formally. But this is the way uh, many people from uh, engineers, physicists, applied mathematicians follow this approach pr pretty much as it is here. They not always know it. They not always acknowledge it but very often they do it. And uh, so number one, you think of all the physics you consider relevant, and I'm going to go over the examples. Um, um, then you identify in that physics, by physics I mean, is there a heat transfer, is there a recrystallization, is there a diffusion, whatever it is. You, you list it, at least in your head. You identify what you consider is dominant. And this is a philo philosophical statement here. Um, the philosophical statement is, in materials uh, engineering, you seldom have a problem that is as easily defined as, here is my one force acting, therefore this happens. We don't have that. We don't have F equals MA in materials engineering. We have more something like sum of forces equals a sum of consequences. Of all the forces and all the consequences, there is one force that dominates over all others. This is a heuristic. It's not always true but it's very often true and seldom used. Uh, then once I identify a dominant factor, uh, I solve the problem, assuming that that's the only thing present. Mathematicians do this. However, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow knowing that you're throwing something, right? We have as human beings and engineers in particular, like this dread of discarding things knowingly. That's what I propose we do. And these people do it. And then we solve the problem. Uh, and you can call yourself either smart or oversimplified. We'll see. Uh, this step four is something I wanted to include for completeness. I'm not going to dwell very much on that. But it's checking for, I, I'm going to call it consistency to make it more general. But I said self-consistency, and I'm going to explain it in a minute. Once you have solved your problem and you check that you're consistent, you compare that to reality. And uh, not everybody does this. Huh? Uh, 
And for good reasons, because when you compare what you do with the reality, sometimes you don't like it. Uh, the reality sucks very often. So, and then, if these comparisons uh, are something you, you are happy with, you can improve your predictions that were something relatively simple by comparing it with this. And uh, if you follow this, you would get something that is simple because you consider the, the simple part. You would get something that is very general because you consider all the, the possible things and you picked on the, the important ones and would be accurate because you have calibrated it with reality in a smart way. <coughs> let's go. Uh, when I said let's all physics uh, consider relevant, I'm going to focus on friction strip welding now. So what, what was in there? Uh, from the video, you, you can guess some things. Things get hot, heat conduction plays a role. Heat's deform, plastic flow plays a role. Uh, as uh, things deform, they generate heat. So we have there. Uh, the way things deform at a given uh, the, uh, strain rate and at a given temperature, uh, it, it, it will have an associated, uh, associated forces. All that comes from a constitutive model how to include it there. Uh, in, in this model, we even included things like the heat losses to the backing plate to a conduction, uh, uh, convection, or radiation to the surface. So I included all this, a little philosophical point. The, the list of all physical phenomena at play is essentially infinite. So if anybody says, you're missing something, is it the same as saying nothing? Because I'm sure I'm missing something. The real question is, am I missing something important? I will the, the, I do this, make this list as general as I think is, it makes sense. I might still fail. There is judgment here. I sure did not include relativity corrections for the movement of the welding torch, right? And I'm pretty confident of that. But there are other things I didn't include that people might or might not agree. Um, so. Two, identify the dominant factors. And by dominant factors, as I said, it's not F equals MA. It's the sum of many forces equals many consequences. Uh, and among these, I would like to include geometry. It's not the same something that is more or less equiax. That's something that is very slender. You can say that something, one thing dominates over others when you have those issues of geometry. So that's why I included here. Uh, the identification of dominant factors is an incredibly important thing. Incredibly important. Uh, that's an area into which I have, uh, um, I, I dived uh, pretty deeply and can go anywhere from being uh, intuitive, like saying, this is what I think based on my great experience and expertise, or uh, can be very formal. Uh, in this, uh, this formal way of going about it is, is what I started to work on my uh, PhD thesis. And uh, it, it's online. You, you, you can check it out. And uh, it's good for going to sleep. Uh, uh, now, once you identify the dominant factors, you can quantify the relevance of the secondary factors, the things you said, I know this exists, but I'm not going to account for this as the, the, the main explanation. It's a conscious decision, but you quantify it. And, and again, this can be formal, intuitive, anywhere in between. For friction strip welding, I did it in an intermediate way. Uh, I, I could have written more complex equations and do it in a formal way. I just took a shortcut and do it in a somewhat intuitive way. For example, I'm going to say in this friction strip welding that conduction dominates over advection. So conduction is if something is hot on this table, some, at some point, the heat will reach other parts of the table. That's conduction. Advection is if I'm moving, as, as it happens in welding, right? Like torch is there, the plate moves, or the other way around. You're transporting the heat as you move the plate. That's advection. And what I'm saying is that for friction strip welding, conduction dominates over advection. And it, it has this expression, if you were to work out the equations, that something called the Peclet number has to be much less than one for that case. If you were working on electron beam welding or laser welding, this would be exactly the opposite. Advection dominates over conduction. And then in, uh, at, later on, we'll check whether this hypothesis makes sense. It's good for my math. Uh, 
but uh, does it make sense with reality? Two, I'm also going to say that uh, of this plastic flow that I said is part of the physics, the rotational part dominates over the translational. So in layman terms, the pin is, is spinning like crazy, right? And, uh, the, and the plate moves slowly. Does it make sense or doesn't? We'll check on that. But this has an expression. And of course, if I pass this dividing on the other end, I would get a dimensionless group. Uh, I'm going to say another thing. Uh, that when I said there is localized heat and plastic deformation in the, um, in, uh, around the pin, right? I'm going to call that the shear layer. And I'm going to say that this shear layer is very thin. Uh, again, we have to check on that. But let me tell you something. Uh, for, for more than 100 years, the field of fluid mechanics was very advanced, but people could not figure out why it doesn't matter what calculation you did, you get that the drag of bodies in a fluid was zero. Until a guy named Prantl came up with the concept of a boundary layer. And what his, what, uh, op that's the one most important paper in, in the history of fluid mechanics. It's a very simple one. And all he did is, if I have a very thin layer in which uh, the physics is a little bit different than what is outside, I can un unlock all these issues and, and crack through the problem of the, the zero drag. Nobody had applied this to friction strip welding, although the problem is, for the most part, very, very similar. So you apply this. This is coming from fluid mechanics. Uh, and then the, the, this four point, uh, fourth point that is uh, actually pretty contentious, but uh, I'm going to back it up, uh, is you have in friction strip welding a pin that rotates and a shoulder that pushes the, the deformed metal and, and prevents it from the deformed metal from extruding out. Uh, that, this shoulder uh, uh, has friction against the surface and, uh, and that generates heat. I will argue here that the effect of the shoulder on the, on the temperature near the pin is secondary. Not everybody agrees on this. Uh, I will back it up, but still it's, it's like a, not a super strong backing. But I'm going to say this. And, and this is the way I identify my dominant factors. Uh, I quantify the relevance of the secondary ones. And then some other things I left untested in here. And uh, I mean, some things, uh, some risk you're going to take. Uh, I assume that my pin is cylindrical and with no threads. But many people have conical pins, or uh, not uh, truncated cones, and they typically have threads, and, and some even crazier shapes. Uh, I'm also assuming that the pin and the, the metal undergoing plastic deformation do not slide past each other. There is an interface between the steel pin and the aluminum substrate, or whatever generalization we have. That interface has no sliding. That is, again, something that now most people would agree with this, but I'm taking it on faith, right? So just to get a, a sense of how I'm going about this, I, I'm more rigorous than most because I'm listing some things I do. I'm not perfectly rigorous because some things I'm not, not testing for. So step three. Now, solve the approximate problem considering dominant balance. Uh, so this, this uh, only the dominant factor. Dominant balance is a technique. Solve the approximate problem considering only the dominant factor. So I recommend, this is not, not essential. Mathematicians don't do this, engineers do it. But they are not aware. Uh, I consider using only a characteristic value. What do I mean by this? Temperature. Temperature is a field that depends on x, y, z, and time. But very often, you care about your maximum temperature, not about the temperature at every, absolutely every point. Sometimes you do. But what I'm saying is, it's useful to focus on the characteristic values before we get distracted with fields. Um, uh, and, and I actually wrote a whole paper on that, uh, that is in the Journal of Applied Mechanics and that, that I cited here. You can go really deep on, on that. That is so simple to say. If you do this consideration and of only characteristic values, and you solve the equations, they typically, the, the, the solution of the equations uh, 
turns out to be in the form of power loss. Uh, that's what people often call scaling loss. Uh, and, and there's a whole world behind this that you can even have philosophical explanations why the world should be explained in the form of power loss. Very interesting. But it's, I'm going to take it just as a fact. Uh, and then the identification of the dominant factors might not always be trivial. If you have, this problem was relatively easy in its mathematical formulation. What I did in my PhD in which we have heat transfer and fluid flow and free surfaces and electromagnetic stirring and, and buoyancy and uh, uh, gas shear, uh, we couldn't tell which one of those many forces was the, the one that uh, dominated over all the others. And for that, uh, there, uh, there are techniques and ways to go about it into which I worked. But let's focus on, uh, on, the, on this friction stir welding problem. Based on the hypothesis I, I mentioned at the beginning, which I have not tested, so you have to take them on faith at this, at, as far as this slide goes, I can write my heat transfer equation this way. That's a very simple equation. Uh, even if this is not linear, it's still very simple. And now, if I consider, but now, temperature in, for this problem is a pseudo steady state, so time is, doesn't matter. Uh, with the simplifications I made, you end up having a radial symmetry and I end up having only one coordinate. So temperature depends on x. My field is temperature of, as a function of distance, whatever that distance might be. I don't care about temperature as a function of distance. What is my maximum temperature? That's what everybody talks about. That's when this colleague of mine melted the titanium. The problem was the maximum temperature. The whole evolution of temperature with distance, who cares? He melted it. So I, uh, I can normalize it fo following the, the guidelines of uh, this uh, publication. And uh, you, you would end up with this. This is a differential equation, a simple one, but differential. This is an algebraic equation. And this thing with uh, the, 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 the S, or the, that's the characteristic value. And this little hat here that, that looks kind of cute and seems to make things more complex appears here because it means this value is the value I would get after solving my equation having neglected the secondary factors. Don't need to think too much about it, just so you know that there is a point of having that there. And uh, OK, so the, here I would have the heat generation. Heat generation would be. Uh, stress times shear rate. And this equation is easy to see. Uh, here we have an efficiency of uh, conversion between mechanical work and uh, heat. Some of the, the work uh, is accumulated as the dislocations, right, as it's strain inside the lattice. And that is not turned into heat. But if I were to scale that, this is again a differential equation. Can turn into this, that is an algebraic equation. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. But uh, after punting, I can do it and will be happy to do it. Here's my constitutive law, right? That there is uh, so, some, some form of a zerner holomon equation, which I simplify the hyperbolic sine part. But w we accounted for it somehow, uh, that is in the publication. And if I scale it, and if I'm smart about it, uh, I end up with something that is a power law. Um, interesting how this exponential, this Arrhenius form can turn into a power law, but it can. And I think most people should do it. If you do it, you end up with a, a characteristic temperature. That is a character, the temperature that would divide the uh, significant hard working versus the insignificant hard working that happens uh, in the rest of the plate. And, and here we have conduction, heat conduction in, in the plate far from the pin. This comes from a Rosenthal solution that here we also scaled. Do not worry about, look at these equations as the way you look at a map. Full of details, but you don't need to understand every detail. What matters here is it's a bunch of differential equations that we can turn into a bunch of algebraic equations. Have four equations, have four unknowns. I have my maximum temperature, my heat generation rate, the thickness of my shear layer, and uh, my, uh, uh, shear stress. Those are unknowns. I'm not imposing them. Oh, what did Here, 
if you get that, that system of four equations with four unknowns, this is what you get. Uh, so think of this, because this is beautiful. You might think that this looks complex. That fits in one cell of Excel and needs nothing else other than plugging these values in. But every one of these values is tabulated. Every one of those. For the constitutive model, it's not so easy to find the tabulated values, but we also did a little bit of ser literature search and, 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 and tabulated the data ourselves, and, and we published it. And, um, and much more work could be done. But the point here is that before you do a calculation, you know everything that goes in. These are not formulas that look cute, but who knows where the little Greek letters, what the numbers are that would replace the Greek letters. Self-consistency. I'm going to tell you briefly about this. In this case, I wrote simple equations to start, and I simplify them even more. But in other cases, like uh, what I mentioned about the, the work uh, on, uh, on that involved heat transfer and electromagnetics and fluid flow and many other things, you write enormous equations. And the way you simplify them is by saying, this term I'm going to assume is small. This other term I'm going to assume is small. Self-consistency means you solve the simplified equation, and then we, you use that solution to check that the terms you said were small actually were small. Now the catch is that it's circular reasoning. Assuming that you're right, you confirm you're right. Th this is useful when you, assuming that you're right, you come out that you're wrong. Then you know you're wrong. Um, th th this thing sounds uh, interesting, funny, flaky maybe. Applied mathematicians do it. This is called the method of dominant balance. right? And uh, if they do it, I think we should respect them, right? Uh, and most people do that. Actually, don't think there's a way of breaking away from this, even when we think we are rigorous. We're always assuming something. So this is a way that is very upfront about what it assumes. So step five, compare predictions to reality. So this graph, this graph is extremely important. And if there's one thing I would like to pass along to, for further discussion, is the, this using this type of graphs. I do not have a name for these graphs, and I would accept suggestions. Uh, look at this. Vertical axis, this is what I would call reality, coming either from measurements or numerical models, whatever we trust. And that's also debatable, how much we trust them. But I'm going to assume they are true. And, the, the, and this is reality divided by my estimate. And my estimate has no fudge factor. Comes straight, unadulterated, from those formulas I showed you that use only tabulated data. Nothing else. Because otherwise, they wouldn't be useful. There is no previous experiment I need to do to make those predictions. I did not use any data that came from the world of friction stress welding. So this is reality divided by those predictions only with a priori things. What could we say about that? Well, if my predictions are good, this number should be 1, right? We'll see about that. Uh, we are also going to see that, uh, um, OK, let's talk about the x-axis. The x-axis here, I'm going to show you four graphs. In each of these four graphs, we have the same y-axis, that is reality divided estimate. But in the horizontal axis, I have each one of the, the forces I neglected. I said, this doesn't matter, right? When I said convection uh, dominates over advection. I said that. And that was represented by the Peclet number. So I, I use this dimensionless number in a way in which when it's much less than one, I'm good. It, so when this number is much less than one, for sure, I should have the right order of magnitude. And uh, as you see, in, in these, all these points we, we did our literature search, we're not too far off. I think it's 0.78. We're going to see what that is. But it's a little point 0.8, something like that. So I did get the right order of magnitude. And uh, when this number is big, my model is not good anymore. Or if it is good, it's by coincidence. But I cannot say anything. 
So this is th this other region. What do you get to see? That for lots of practical cases, my hypothesis was true, the hypothesis. So my model does apply for all these practical cases. Uh, and when it applies, I get it more or less right. It also says that there are a bunch of other cases for which my hypothesis did not really apply. In this case, you could argue, say that advection and conduction are more or less even. So my model doesn't really apply. But we include it here, and we see yeah, it's, it's still kind of working, kind of magic. I'm happy that it does. But uh, so I cannot explain this based on my model, but I like it, and I'm going to keep it there. Uh, what do you get to see here, too? Look, uh, some points are for 6061 aluminum. Some are there for other type of aluminum alloys. Look at this, 304 steel, 1018 carbon steel, and they all fall more or less on the same line. I'm going to show you another one. So here is when I said uh, flow from rotation dominates over flow from translation. And it's more or less the same. Uh, and here you get to see even titanium. We have some uh, titanium there. Uh, at this stage, at least some of you might be wondering, what a cheater. Because uh, if I had, I, it's true that I more or less got the right order of magnitude. But if I had expanded my scale here, this would be a cloud. <laughs> how, how could you say I have any meaningful prediction? Because it's pretty interesting that I picked this large scale for the graph, when in reality my variation is just that. But uh, if I'm a cheater, it's not because of this. Because uh, here I have another graph in which I assume that the, the shear layer is thin. right? And the shear layer, I, so when I'm moving that direction, it is thin. When I'm moving that direction, it's thick. So in this area, I should be good. And actually, I am more or less good, right? I'm 0.8 from reality. And as I say the, the part. My, as my hypothesis is weaker and weaker, here I'm saying that the, I'm predicting that the shear layer is 10 times thicker than the pin. It's not true. I'm predicting that, but I'm outside my, my model. And look at this. Right? I it started to depart. And I captured that. And I captured that with a pretty good variation. So there is another one. This is about the, the, the effect of the shoulder um, that Depends on how much you care about frictionless true welding, you might get all up in arms about this graph or not. But from the math point of view, from the procedure point of view, it's comparable to the others. So look at this. Uh, I made a prediction that is very simple and happened to be very general. Uh, and it's reasonably accurate. Because it's 0.8, I would be pretty happy with that. Uh, when uh, we go with the part, some of the hypothesis when it's not valid. For the most time, when I violate my hypothesis, it didn't really hurt me, except in one case in which it departed. So how about calibrating these predictions using this insight? So I identify four sources of error. And I can do something about two of them. Uh, one is error in the published values. That, so if people measure the experiments with some experimental error, which of course you have there, uh, there would be some departure even in my, if my calculation is perfect. I would call that a random error. That would reflect a scatter in these graphs I showed you. In my approxim approximations in the physics, well, we saw that in one of the simple, uh, approximations I did, we could capture some systematic error. Then things like uh, not accounting for relativistic corrections or many other things closer to Earth, there are plenty of those, and they might end up, if I'm not capturing them, they might be reflected as more random error. Uh, I did approximations in the mathematical treatment when I went from differential equations to an algebraic equation based on, uh, on a characteristic value. I did what I called chainsaw mathematics, right? I cut the problem from something very complex to something simple. I'm losing something there. And that error is systematic, because it's math versus math. And uh, also, I plug in materials properties, thermal conductivity, zener holloman parameters. Uh, those also have an error. If you look for thermal conductivity, hey, you guys did this research right on thermal conductivity. And uh, 
uh, you see that there are error bands, even in people measuring the same thing. Those errors would reflect in these graphs as uh, material dependent uh, systematic error. So uh, the, the, these comparisons with reality, I can account for the systematic errors that come from the math or from the physics. So what am I going, oh, okay. How would I go about this? You can do a regression at that stage, but I suggest doing it at that stage, not from the very beginning. And, and here is where, for example, you could use neural networks. I don't use them because I don't know how to use them, and this is a good reason for this collaboration. Uh, now, what is key in my mind is what variables do you pick for that regression? But after doing all this analysis, you guys already see that it, the, the, it fl some variables floated to the surface by themselves. There are these dimensionless groups capturing the secondary factors. So, and we, we can calculate those a priori. So those would be the x-axis of the graphs I showed you. And they didn't come on a whim, they come in a rigorous way. Uh, you can rank those if you wanted. Uh, you can use all of the groups or some of these groups. I, at this point, this is work in progress. I'll tell you what we have done so far with my, my student Karim uh, for friction stir welding. We said of the four forces, the, the four effects that we neglected, for three, we didn't see a big penalty uh, in, in violating the hypothesis. For, a, for one of those, we did see this departure and we captured it. So this, we propose now this functional form for the difference between our estimate and our reality. I made it up and, and, and there's a reason for this notation. But there's some sense in having proposed this. Look, if this hypothesis captured in the dimensionless group is valid, it means this is close to zero. If this is zero, I have a constant value. That constant value would capture the systematic error from the math. Now, if this becomes big, right, I would start capturing the systematic error from the physics I neglected. And uh, something that I, I, I find valuable, but I cannot justify why, if this is really big, we have a power law as a correction factor. And as I said, there are many reasons to believe that power law, the functional form of a power law is, is, has some sort of generality and a special meaning. So we would capture it. But this could perfectly be a neural network. And uh, this doesn't need to be just based on one. I could have done the regression against all the forces. I'm unclear about the balance. Uh, I would be more accurate if I do my regressions against everything. If I want to write an engineering handbook, an engineer would love to know that he has to look for information only on this and not on everything because looking for information takes time. So there is this balance between sim how much information to require and how much accuracy to get out. This graph here are my calibrated predictions. So now is uh, reality in the x-axis, numerical or, or experimental. And in the vertical axis is my scaling law that fits in one Excel cell multiplied by my correction factor. If this was a, a ball bearing, this would be your C1, C2, C3. This, uh, I use this notation that, whatever. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you get to see that things fit in this 45 degree line. And they better do because I did a regression. So for sure, they have to fit in a 45 degree line. What is interesting here is that I put 100% of all the data we had available. There is nothing we excluded. And w all that data from aluminum to carbon steel to stainless steel to titanium fits with a, a standard deviation of plus minus 12%. I'd say it's pretty good. Uh, I didn't do the experiments. I'm not cheating there. Right? Um, and although I'm doing regressions, my regressions are to fine tune something that was already 80% right. So uh, we also even see one outlier here. I don't know if that outlier means that my methodology is not right, or, or maybe there could be some reassessment of what happened there. Um, so what has happened here? 
I got something that is simple because it fits in a single Excel cell. It is general because the same formula was valid for a whole range of alloy systems. Uh, it uses only tabulated data known a priori. I do not need to do an experiment and measure a torque, for example, to use as an input. And uh, accurate is a subjective assessment, but plus minus 12% in welding is typically good. If I do the same experiment twice, the same thing is, uh, <laughs> tends to be within this error band. Um, this is my last slide. Possibilities. Uh, I may just bring this up. Uh, to, to bounce some ideas. Imagine we want to consider the performance of steels under time and temperature related to, to this uh, work of yours uh, on that had a uh, failure uh, at, at temperature, right? So I would say that step one of list of physics considered relevant, um, we have discussed zener holomon or coarsening, um, and I do not mean to claim any expertise on this. I'm trying to reflect some things, uh, that this might include diffusion and other effects, right? Uh, if we identify the dominant factors, there are some factors that are dominant at a low temperature and some factors that are dominant at a higher temperature. Based on that, you can establish right there a dimensionless group. That would be the, um, for example, strain rate at a given low, the given temperature of one versus the other. Uh, Possibility. I'm not claiming any, anything uh, being really true. Now, based on that, when one of these factors is dominant, you can solve the approximate problem considering only one dominant factor. As actually, you have already done, right? So you can have this expression. The catch, what I would suggest here, is to use tabulated data. And I put an asterisk here. I'll assess the asterisk later. You check for self-consistency, but in this case, I don't think uh, it, it applies. Then you compare it for, to reality. What I would have suggested in cases like this is uh, have a graph of uh, measured rates of deformation versus uh, what we consider dominant rate. That would be my y-axis. And in the x-axis, I would put my dimensionless group or groups, whatever we decide it is. To the left of that graph would be when these neglected physics are really negligible, or we expect them to be negligible. To the right one, it's not. And uh, then calibrate the predictions. If we were to have only one dimensionless group that I can see there, uh, would be very simple. Now, here's a catch. I, I suggest to use tabulated data, but A, or sigma reference, or the exponent, or the activation energy. Those are not so easily tabulated, especially if we consider like al alloy ranges. Um, then is when I, for example, would use uh, a neural network. And uh, what I would imagine, it, in my ignorance of this problem, but with the, the way I do it in other cases, I would try to th do things like, uh, for example, the case of uh, uh, the activation energy you could pick something that is a, a, a reasonable reference value. For example, what the slowest diffuser is, or w whatever that the, the activation and what could be. I would suggest to have two stages of correction factors. One that is, would be a simple linear along the lines of the carbon equivalent, because it's very easy to use. And that would incorporate already the correction for systematic uh, error. And then I would have a, a second coefficient that could come from neural networks that, uh, that would require a little bit more effort or skill in, from the point of view of the user, but would be around one. Because I'm already capturing the ballpark with this, this linear function would take care of the systematic error. So things would be more or less one. And this other one, would be the one, the polish that makes it shine. Um, so this is uh, a, a possible way about it. So with this, I'm, I'm, I'm done, and we can talk over punting. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, OK? So please do ask. I know you are jumping. <laughs>
Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, could you do, just go back in the slide where you showed uh, for the first time the equations, the original and the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, previous, that one. Have you tried actually to solve those equations to check if the solutions behave like the simplifications that you make? Because as far as I know, when you have like very complex solutions, well, very complex equations, you may have certain solutions that when you, su you simplify them, you may lose them. And in the end, as you are simplifying them, you will have like this power law uh, relations, which in the end you just fit the, the coefficients. So have you tried to solve them to check if the assumptions or the solutions are actually correct and not just, uh, you know, fitting uh, the, the exponents? Uh, I'm pretty curious about it. Uh, for example, you're talking about this or about in general? In general. I'm okay. So the, the answer is, in general, for this, for this one problem, I have not solved the exact equations to compare. Right. I'm f very confident that this represents this. But my confidence comes of having done this comparison for many other problems, right. including problems that are way more complex th th than this, including heat transfer and fluid flow and those type of things. So by now, uh, I, w when I do this, and, unless I anticipate a problem, I'm fairly confident that this captures it. Uh, simplifications can be tricky, as it happened in fluid mechanics 100 years ago, when, when you neglect things that have uh, boundary layers or have like this type of stiff behavior, this approach in which I haven't gone too deep, but this stage is exactly about capturing those. Mm -hmm. So it's... So there's no fitting. Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious because, I mean, you can just appro I mean, approximate one simple equation, with, but when you just, you know, take all the, all the, all, I mean, all the equations, uh, maybe it's not that easy, and maybe may not agree. I mean, I'm just curious. No, no, absolutely, and I'm glad you're curious. Uh, what, what I would suggest is, uh, if you have a chance, we, we sit down and talk, because up to 17 equations with 17 unknowns, right. I have done, and uh, I had partial differential equations, and, and there is a way of also accounting formally for the propagation of errors. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I still don't understand why the factor has to be close to one when we multiply C one, C two, C three. Oh, uh, okay. Well, uh, let's see where where it could be a good uh, indication. Okay, here. What I'm proposing is, is something somewhat similar in, in, in philosophy to the Taylor series. You have a, an, uh, an initial term, and as you add more detail, this detail is kind of small, right? And that's why sometimes you can say, oh... Or, you explained 80% of the problem. Right, okay. right. <laughs> so uh, if, if, uh, if what I'm saying, this ballpark thing, is more or less right, one divided the other should be more or less one. So if you don't get that level of agreement, then you should go back and get the... I, I, exactly, exactly. And, and that's what these graphs are all about, showing that there is that, that level of agreement. Okay. If, if you don't, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a useless battle. You have dimensionless graphs, but have no more power than a dimensional graph. Yeah. <coughs> I have a very simple question. Hmm. I was wondering, how does this approach help there? I mean, you mentioned, I mean, the friction style welding is usually for aluminium. Mm -hmm. When you come to welding through friction style, say steel, mm -hmm. so the choice of the pin becomes very important. And people mm -hmm. have been trying, like, tungsten rhenium and also poly uh, carbon boron nitride and polycrystalline. Does this approach help us in choosing that? I think the answer is yes. And uh, if you're interested in that, I'd like to talk about it. Because from this approach... So you, your I, main point is the conduction, you know, and the rotation speed. I think... But what are the other properties of pin, which could be also, in ranking, might become more important? Well, let me tell you and something. For, for, from this approach, I, I came to a conclusion, which I'm pretty sure, confident is right, but I'm, I, I cannot prove it yet, that... Uh, 
you can cooling the pin, pin makes no sense. And the reason is, remember when I talked about if you turn the Arrhenius into uh, some sort of power law, you end up with a critical temperature. You must reach that critical temperature. So if you somehow cool the pin, well, one way or another, you'll make up to that temperature because it doesn't matter how much you cool the pin, your substrate has some intrinsic needs that are from its own material. And then that all that would bring a different philosophy for, for uh, uh, tool design. We'd uh, love to talk about that. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now. So thank you very, very much for an excellent Thanks. Very nice. Oh, thank you, Harry.